Okay, so this is the second time that I am filming this. Um, it, every once in a while it just happens and I uh, have a bunch of different sticks that I'm rotating through and there are just a comp couple times in which I just get out of the cycle, correct cycle, and I wipe what I've done. And it's very frustrating when that happens. I mean, I tend to take a long time with my walkthroughs. And so when I delete them, it is very frustrating. <laughs> um, but I suppose on the bright side, the benefit is, is that I can probably be more succinct because I've already gone through this all and I have a better understanding of it. So this is not my first impressions of these cards. I have flipped through these cards once already um, and shuffled them and laid some out and done a reading um, after um, I had done was done doing the walkthrough. So I suppose in the end, um, it, it can be a better perspective. Um, I do want to mention, so the, the, what I'm here to do is a walkthrough of the Edward Munk. I think it is Munk. Um, it's, Nor it's a Norwegian name, and I know there's a V here, but the pronunciations I've seen or I've listened to have sounded more like Edward. Uh, you don't really hear pronounced V. Now... That may or may not be correct, but from what my understanding is that it sounds like Edward Munk. Um, I do not speak Norwegian, although I should because I have so much of it in my DNA. Um, but it, it doesn't transfer that way for some reason, and I, I certainly wish that it would. So he is a was a Norwegian um, artist, um, and so this is a deck of all from his body of work. Now, this deck is from um, Red, Publish, uh, Red Orchid Publishing and is curated by Miss Melanie, and I, uh, Melanie Ava Henson. Um, and so I say curated because uh, her deck is, um, she has went through the collection of works by Edward Munch and she has um, curated the art pieces um, to create a deck on relationships. I have another deck by uh, Miss Melanie's, which is the Art History Tarot for Past Lives. Um, I have a walkthrough of this up already, and I'll put a link to that in the description box. If not, you can Google this and with review and um, on, on YouTube and find it. Um, I have used this deck continually since I did that walkthrough, since I received the deck. And it is on something that I use in every one of my past life readings. And I really appreciate this um, deck. So I have had a lot of use with it. It feels, I don't know, I'll have to compare this cardstock. I don't know if it's the exact same cardstock, but I will say... This deck has been riffle shuckle, shuckle, <laughs> riffle shuffled to death. I um, uh, did the edges black. Um, and it is held up beautifully. It is still nice and straight. Um, it riffle shuffles like a dream. It's not chipping. And again, I've used this deck a lot this year. Um, and so it has... Um, held the test of time for me um, and in terms of use I found it really helpful so what I like about um, Melanie is that in both cases of these decks she has seen where there was a lack and then made something to fill that that lack so for example there are very few there still are very few past life decks um and so and especially when she created this one there were even less than there are now and um so she saw that lack and past life readings were something that she did and so she created a deck to fill the need and in this case she used it used all kinds of uh historical art to represent places and time places of the artist either where they were born or where they did predominantly did their work and times based on the um you know either when that painting was created or when that painting was depicted and she associated these with tarot cards through astrological correspondences now i will say one of the, my only downside after having used this deck for a long time my only downside to this deck is i wish that the title of the painting and the artist and the time were larger because 
even with my glasses, I have a hard time reading this. So I do tend to always need to go to the book um, to grab out where that where and when, um, which is what I primarily use this for, is. Um, so I wish that this text was a little larger. I see that she has um, address that in this current deck this is much easier for me to be able to read what i love about this deck is that i really don't use it as a tarot deck and I, so that's the caveat i'm going to say and after having already gone through this one um, i'm going to probably say the same thing about this deck um, i think that melanie does a great job with keywords um, that go with the concept of past life readings and so when i am pulling so i'm generally only pulling pulling for where and a when, and then I'm pulling for something that may be um, coming up, um, you know, connects the two the current life and that life together. Um, I'm mostly looking at her keywords for in, a, in an oracle sense, although those are directly connected to um, the tarot cards, but I'm really just relying on her system in this and it works really well for me. And after having gone through this, I feel like I'm going to probably end up doing the same thing. I would never really use either one of these decks. Again, I haven't used this one much. This one I've used a ton. I wouldn't just take this deck to use as a traditional traditional tarot deck to do any kind of readings. Like this is something that I use strictly for past life readings. I think you could do it for um, other, some other like internal work kind of readings and things like that. But I use this primarily for past life and it's what it's made for and it's what it's best suited for. So I wouldn't just use this as a sort of catch all tarot deck to use for readings. And I feel like this was made, this deck, oh I know that she created this deck because she saw a need for a good decks on relationships for relationship readings both personal internal relationships and also interpersonal relationships and she saw a lack there and so she cre and she was also diving into the work um, of Edward Munch and so she saw that there was a, a potential of using his artwork for this and so she created this now um, I, again, I don't think I would ever take this deck and use this to do just regular everyday readings about work or, um, you know, just basic, just, just ra random readings. I would only be pulling this out for sort of that interpersonal work or that intrapersonal connective uh, to other people kind of work. But I have to say, as a tarot reader, um, I, don't, I don't think there are a lot of good relationship decks out there. And a lot of the ones that I have looked at have been and kind of ooey gooey right just a little just more like romantic and sometimes when we're talking about relationships it's not all about this you know beautiful victorian -y, romantic -y, and i'm not talking about the victorian romantic deck i do use that deck for relationships and i find it to be really deep um, but i'm talking about that kind of flowery um, feeling romantic style decks where um, there's a lot going on in relationships we have two people with their own or or, or more uh, I'm not gonna this is a just two but for the most part right we're looking at more than one person um, who are bringing their own um, baggage and their own internal issues together and commingling those two and then so there's often a lot of work um, that goes into there's also a lot of heartbreak in, re, involved in relationships um, even in long-lasting relationships there still involves a lot of hurt and a lot of heartbreak that has to be dealt with as well so I feel like a good solid a deeply pulling deck in terms of relationship is something that's needed so again that's one of the things that I like about Melanie is that what I'm seeing is somebody who um, you know is seeing where there is a lack and then stepping forward to try to fulfill that lack um, so this deck I've used a ton there is another this did not come with a box um, but there is another version of this deck now that does um, come in a tuck box uh, and so uh, and this a tuck box is really nice um, it's um, quite sturdy and none of us are like you know nobody's gonna go oh my gosh uh i love a good tech box right i don't know i feel like it's the same i feel like it's the same card stock um and it's like i said I, it's held up really well for me but this is nice it's sturdy it's it's not wobbly it doesn't feel like it's gonna fall apart um it's you know it's just a, it's a nice basic good you know protect your cards 
uh, check box. Uh, although I will say this has, um, especially over the last month or two, this has gone every time I'm, I go out of town. This is come because I've just been doing a this year has been a year of a lot of past life readings. The whole year has just been that way. Um, and so every time I go anywhere out of town, I have thrown this into my bag as is in this box, you know, in this bag. And I've not had any problem with it. It's held up really, really well. So again, I know this isn't this deck, but it's my experience with another deck that the author has created. And of course, that does influence me. If I've had an experience with um, an author or a creator of a deck, it's going to make me more inclined to see what they're doing next. Now, I will say, um, you can see this guidebook is amazing. It's color. It's gorgeous. I really like what she's done here, especially here. We'll come back to that. Um, I, but I will say that I do love this size. Um, I think this could have been, you know, made larger print for, again, those of us with not the greatest eyesight. Um, but I do like this size. I have a drawer that's right here that holds, I don't really reference guidebooks a whole lot uh, we've talked about this before um, but there are some that I do reference all the time and they go right there and this is one of them it lives over here and I like the size of it it kind of goes you know along with the other books like that I would have in here um, that are just good guidebooks that I want to uh, reference back to or you know Aesop's Fables for reading uh, Bibliomancy and Emily Dickinson for Bibliomancy you know a good bibliomancy is important. So anyways, my point is, is that I appreciate the gorgeousness of this, but I do say I do like this particular size that's there. Um, but when you see this, why I like this, you'll be like, okay, well, that's worth it being larger. Um, okay. So I want to put this out because I, you can see I did not light the candles because people um, get, last time got horrified that I was putting um, a cloth uh, over candles and potentially catching things on fire. Um, this is, she sent me this beautiful um, cloth, reading cloth um, or scarf just to wear. It's, it's large and it's beautiful. What I love about this is that after having gone through the deck, this is one of my favorite paintings um, in the deck. Um, I love, and I love the choice of it for a reading cloth because you have this light and you have this shadow that's going on over here and so it really feels like a great scene if I would have picked any of the paintings this would have been one I picked um, and so it is it's just beautiful I actually love this painting um, I don't traditionally use um, a lot of terracotta I have quite a few of them um, because I love the concept of them but they never fit in this space that I have you know to film in but one of the nice things about you know working on the cabin and going out of town and things is that I am starting to use cloths more when I go uh, out and about because then I have bigger space. Um, and so I am looking forward to actually using this um, and I think it will go with you know many of the decks that I use. So I wanted to put that on before I lit any candles so that I didn't catch anything on fire or horrify people. Um, watching and waiting for me to catch something on fire. <laughs> um, I'm going to um, shut the curtain. It's just a beautiful day out. Um, and so I'm kind of leaving it a little bit shiny, I know, um, until... Um, until I get to looking at the cards directly. So I want to talk about the guidebook for um, a minute because it is stunning, as you can see. Let me move it in here a little bit with what we need it's a big book we need to see it's like a you know it feels like the size of like a magazine you know if you're re looking at a magazine that's what it feels like um so she goes in and talks out obviously it's called the edward munk tarot for relationships by red orchard um, publishing or melanie ava henson she has an um introduction where she talks about how she ended up um, focusing on this. She talks about um, channeling Edward Munch. Um, she actually ran into his artwork when, oh, did I put it away? See, I, I had things all out and then I lost the footage. 
and I put it I think because I'm gonna I'll do a walkthrough of these two later um, but she created this tarot journal journal of healing and heartbreak uh, and this is a you know looks like a gorgeous I haven't really looked at it too much or worked with it I'm going to and then um, I'll do talk uh, about that oops 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 oh no um, and this is a past life workbook that a lot of, of, of people since I did the walkthrough and that they know that I use the deck have told me that I really needed to work with this haven't you know she just sent it so I will um, take a look at that and um, use it um, and come back with a review on that I think I'm gonna have to shut the curtain here let's get some consistency of light here I suppose let me put this back okay so while she was working on the Tarot Journal for Healing Heartbreak, she really felt like Munch's embraced relationships as a theme with greater internalization and vulnerability than other painters. And she fell in love with the subjective quality of his expressionist work. Um, and so while she had used 78 different historical um, paintings in her uh, art history tarot for past lives, um, she felt like she could use his body of work to do a relationship reading. So she talks about that. Um, she does talk about the issue with gender. When you are using a deck um, that is from one painter's body of work, um, of course much of that deck is going to embody their um, expression of relationships. In this case he is certainly a male um, who um, had many relationships or multiple relationships with women. So um, most of his work um, uh, images that would regard marriage or something like that are going to have that there. And so she does have a section about that. She does talk about the inherent problem of that um, as well as uh, the way in which this is a problem that we have using any deck that uses older artwork um, whether it be a historical decks whether it be the Rider Waite Smith deck um, the um, that binary of male and female um, exists and that then it is imperative for us as readers to look behind or beyond that that symbolic masculine and feminine and really understand that um, you know if the emperor comes up in a reading um, that is not just about uh, a man right so the emperor cut can and does come up in a reading for me all the time and it's it's embodying something with Within myself same thing with the magician or all the other traditional males and same thing with female um, back and forth with female that then it becomes we do have to do that extra work to make sure that we aren't um, slipping into okay just because there's a male on this card does not mean that this is speaking to a male in a relationship and we've got to be careful of that um, so she does talk about how it's not ideal um, when you're coming and using one body of work for that so she talks about that and then she talks about the unique qualities of the deck. This is a deck that has both upright and horizontal. And this was to maintain the images of the artwork. And so while that is not an ideal for me, I actually don't. I think most people probably don't like decks that have portrait and horizontal. Some, some do and some pull it off well. For me, it's more problematic if most of the deck is one way and then there's just a couple horizontal. That irritates me more than something like this that is quite there's a, there's plenty of both of them I didn't count them out but it's it's a pretty balanced it's it doesn't feel like there's all portraits and a few horizontal or vice versa it feels pretty balanced between the two um, so she does talk about that and that the purpose of it was to maintain the artwork and so then I can get behind it because some of these art pieces I, once you start looking through them had she done them portrait ways she would have been losing significant parts of the painting um, and vice versa so it makes sense to me and I actually found that I enjoyed it I did a couple readings after my first attempt at a walkthrough and I kind of enjoyed it and that's not something that's normal for me so I'll have to see over time but I didn't find it to be problematic I think because I know the purpose behind it makes sense to me and because it is pretty balanced between the two of them 
Um, she does talk about um, the court cards in this deck. The queens and the kings don't have any sort of keyword on them. It's just the queen of swords and the king of swords. And I think she really, and I don't think, she does relate those more to specific people and different types, personality types of people. Um, I don't really read my courts that way. I could see where that would be useful in a relationship. Um, I wouldn't go back personally to the traditional way of looking at court cards as being say you know the swords are going to be about dark hair and dark um, um, eyes or that cups are going to be about blondes and, and blue eyes or whatever I wouldn't I think that would be really confining for me but I think more looking at their personality type uh, also could go by their um, sign you know their um, astrological signs um, with the kings and the queens um, you could certainly do that but they also just can describe a personality type um, and I think that that can be helpful so they just say Say king of king and queen but the the pages represent a significant childhood event or something that may have may get stirred up from a person either you the person if you're just doing interpersonal work or between one of the people um, and then the knights show an event that is within the relationship that could be really uplifting could be altering in some way could be not so good could be positive or negative on the relationship so the pages and the knights are about events from childhood or during the relationship and then the kings and the queens are representing people she does have a sample spread here. I do wish there were a few more spreads. I know that she's like fantastic at spreads. Um, there's definitely um, spreads in, sorry, and she references um, there are spreads uh, in the healing book and there are lots of spreads in the past life books but these us is obviously very specific to past life readings so I, I would have I would have liked maybe one or two more uh, ideas for relationship spreads um, you can google relationship tarot spread and get a billion of them and then modify them um, to what works for you so there's a lot out there um, so that's just kind of it there's not much in the intro and it gets right in into the guidebook. Now, I really found after having gone through this whole deck uh, and flipping the pages as I went the whole time, um, I like this guidebook a lot. And it's all most, I mean, this is great, but this is what I love is this section here on every page, including um, the minors as well. And what I love is that A, we're seeing the whole painting because no matter what, some things had to get cropped. No matter what way, what way she went so if you look at the fool card um, we can see you know we've we've got this, this sort of middle section here um, and so we see the whole painting we see the name and the date and again there are curated decks I know of curated decks that do not show you what is the name of the painting and in this case we know who it was because the whole thing is by the same artist um, but they don't show that and that's so frustrating um, whereas it's a big definitely a pet peeve for me um, and so she has the name of the painting as well as the timing in which the painting was made and then she has a section on divining the art so here we have a section where um, you think that the creeper might be this guy but it's actually talking about the creeper um, which is a vine um, on the house and how that being behind him as he's walking away and how that could apply how that could be read um, I think this is fantastic. If I'm getting a deck like this where an artist or a curator has chosen art to represent their cards in their deck, um, to be able to see what was it about this painting that they were zeroing in on um, is I think what I that's what I want to come to a guidebook for I understand what the fool means and especially with her keyword there I can get a pretty good idea of where she's going with um, in the direction of that card but I love to see why out of all of his his artwork did she choose this one for the fool and how could that enhance the way that this this card is read um, this to me is gold um, she does give you like a general reading if how if you're looking at it as how somebody might be seeing you and then a future if you're reading this card as a future event or an outcome card um, that um, 
and this is important because if you look at her sample spread, she talks about how I see them, the person in a relationship, um, how they see me. So then this helps to see how could you how could you interpret that? Um, and then there's outcomes or future and outcomes. And so then how would you read this card in a future or an outcome setting? So it gives you what the necessary components to work with it in the way that she would see that being done. But then again, I feel like this is is where the gold is it just to me is uh, that's what interests me so and then we have that of course all the way through to the uh last uh which is a self-portrait of um mook um you probably would know him i should have said this at the beginning you probably would know his art from the scream i think that's probably the most well the most record this is powerful um it's probably what you would know his artwork, although I did know some of these other paintings. There was a woman in a red dress that I know that I'd seen before. I'd seen the wound before. I thought it was called the vampire. Um, I'd seen that one. So some of these I had seen. Uh, this one I had definitely seen before. Um, so some of these I recognize, but uh, many of them I didn't. You know, I've never really looked into um, his artwork as a, a, a scope of his artwork. Um, so yeah, I really think that, um, you know, great job on the guidebook. Um, so the cards themselves, here's the backings, they are reversible. I would definitely color these black like I did the art history ones. Um, and I like that I can read the tarot much better here. Um, and then it has the, again, sort of oracle keyword. Uh, there's only one of these I think that I was, that didn't quite work for me in terms of with the um, tarot card but again I don't really see myself using this as a tarot deck for me I think again she does a really good job or she does with the art history with her keywords um, and so for me I see this as being more of an oracle deck with that connection to the tarot card should I want to go to that space um, that's how I approach <laughs> the uh, other deck and I would see myself approaching this the same way um, so there's that okay Let's zoom in here okay so here we have of course the major arcana starting with the fool um, she talks about the um, creeper again as referring to the climbing vines that grow alongside buildings in Virginia and she talks about the blood representing vines on the house in the background ask you to observe what is the truth that lays behind you um, and then you're then moving away from that because we know that the fool isn't truly the beginning right he's usually depicted at the top of a mountain so obviously he has um, you know, he has already had experiences to get to that mountain, but it's a new beginning. What are you leaving behind? So there's a lot, and that's one of the things that I've noticed in this deck, uh, or in his artwork, is that there's a lot of room for reading both the light and the shadow, and that's, you know, I think that's really fantastic. Same thing with the magician. Um, oh, another thing I wanted to point out is that when they're actual people, she gives us that information. Like, we find out who this is. This portrait is of Eva... Uh, Mudo Mudochi, I'm not sure, a lover and longtime friend of Mook's um, and goes in to talk about how that might relate. Same thing with the magician. I love that. There's another deck that I absolutely love, Divine Muses Oracle. She does the same thing. If there are images there that relate to a person in life, um, she gives us that information and how could that um, affect uh, the nuance in the, the reading and I really, really appreciate that. Um, I do love this magician. He had, and she talks about the hat and it kind of relates to both the sleight of hand feel of the original magicians, but then obviously the way that we see magicians in a more modern context. Plus I just love that image beautiful wise woman for the high priestess it's just a gorgeous sketch or painting this is a lithograph uh, fertile woman for the empress and she even talks about whether or not is this woman rising out of water is she lying down flat um, you know she she 
uh, focuses on the specific artwork and how that might inform the actual reading. And again, very much appreciate that. The Patriarch, um, I really love this painting for the Patriarch because I like how casual he seems to be in, comfortable and casual he is in his rulership. Um, it seems like he's surveying his domain. It works to me very well for the Emperor and for Patriarch. Now I found the last time that I should have just started this way. Um, it's a little bit difficult to do a walkthrough like this because things do go back and forth. So I found this works the best. I know that it's not ideal. Um, and some people will not not like me holding it. I've, there's other decks that I've had to do this with and it just worked better. Um, so this was interesting for me that the wedding was the Hierophant. At first I was like, oh, that's interesting. Why wouldn't you do that for the lovers? But it makes a lot of sense because if you think about the Hierophant as being about traditions and things like that, and so this traditional wedding um, that's taking place and that idea of we can get too caught up in traditions. Traditions can be great, but they can also be very restricting. Um, so I quite like that because then it leaves the lovers for, you know, the actual lovers there. I also like, while obviously, as she noted, there can be problems with um, gender, um, you know, having various, having only one uh, gaze of a gendered couple, as in male and female. Um, I do think some of the cards are ambiguous, um, and I think that that helps, obviously, in terms um, of, of while we know that this person, this artist, had one experience, his own experience that he was painting. For from um, some of the cards are enough um, like this that I think uh, although you can certainly if you look closely tell what you're looking at but um, I do like that that at least is there we have the drive for the chariot I love some of his sketchy uh, sketchier style of his I just I do like his art style I didn't really know if I would or not but I do this was the one that I had a little bit of problem with with, with divorce being justice um, but you know if we have if we think about le legal ramifications um, in relationships that generally will be divorce um, but I guess I see justice in such a, a light of clarity um, that I would have, I don't know, I would have maybe seen divorce in the tower or something like that. Um, but again, because I'm mostly going to be using this as an oracle deck, I don't think that that's going to get in my way too much. But I do really love this painting because she talks about how, you know, this is somebody that he had a relation and like, we don't, who is this shadow figure back here? But this would represent him and a person that he had a long-term tumultuous relationship with and that he actually cut this painting in half um, and that's what we're seeing here is where it was actually cut in half in life um, so I think that that's really cool and certainly works with a divorce card and again I don't think wedding and divorce have to be actual weddings and divorces but they are that severing and or that joining uh, in a long-term relationship for the hermit we have withdrawal uh, for fate, we have, uh, for the Wheel of Fortune, we have fate. Again, I thought this was a bit of an interesting card uh, or, or painting to use for this, although she goes into great lengths um, and describes how there is this one, let's see if I can cross over here and try to get it here. Um, they just talk about very being very comfortable in this level of, of vulnerability that's here. The window's wide open. Um, there is a house plant that's right here. There is the Wheel of For Fortune is a traditionally positive card, and this idea that things everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be work out, things are just as they're supposed to be. We have the wound here for strength and then of course the healing. Now it does have connotations of a vampire, um, which could be, you know, again, sometimes it is a consensual vampire. <laughs> They're not all, she does talk about how, you know, he might be being bitten on his, uh, without, by not his choice. Although I don't think the figure to me looks that way, even in the full painting, you can see a little bit more, uh, but he seems to have his arm around her. So it feels a little bit more like the Bohemian Gothic devil, right? Where it doesn't sometimes, um, 
you know, something that is, is a consensual thing there. Um, but we do all have wounds, obviously, uh, often with relationships. We have silence for the hanged man. This is a really interesting card here for death because it shows sort of the maiden, the mother, uh, fertile mother, and the crone. But then we actually have Munch uh, himself in the shadows um, that adds a particularly interesting nuance to that. But this idea of change and embracing transformation that's going to incur occur. Um, in this case, we're seeing that across um, women. And then what does that mean to other people's gaze and how does that affect the way that we see ourselves in our bodies um, as we change um, and or our inner space. This doesn't have to be all physical, but I thought this was a very interesting painting. Dynamic for temperance. This was also, and I, I mean, I highly, if, if this is a deck that you end up getting, I highly recommend reading um, this because she really talks about um, You can expect traditional balance and tranquility with this major arcana, but colored with a streak of excitement as well. So she, I just feel like she does a great job of explaining why she chose a particular um, painting. Um, and I think it's one of those that are well worth going to the book over. The Devil was interesting because this was a self-portrait in the depths of hell or something. <laughs> something like that was the name of it, so it certainly works. We have separation in the tower. So again, I think that this could have been the divorce card, you know, it, but the, again, justice does have that idea of legality that's, that's built in, um, which is different than a separation at times. So um, I think probably in a relationship deck, having both may end up being something that's really great. I love the star card. I love the full painting. She shows again, you know, you can only get so much. Um, but, you know, you're able to see the full painting, and yet we're only being able to obviously see that bit. So I really like being able to see the full um, paintings that are there. So guidance, um, intuition for the moon, trusting your instinct and your intuition. I love this painting as well. This is joy uh, or the sun card, and I just, this painting does bring joy. Um, awakening for the judgment card, which is perfect. The world, uh, everything is sort of that picture perfect, little white fence kind of perfect world here. Um, and then we get into the minors. Um, I love the um, aces and I'll hold them out again and um, come back to them um, and show them all together. But we have ace for the ace of cups or hope for the ace of cups commitment for the two of cups i like this as well because again uh it's very they're in the shadows it's very to me very neutral tone this could be anybody and very often the two of cups of course you know shows two a man and a woman that are coming together in union um and so i do like that this is quite neutral friendship I like this card a lot. Oftentimes, you know, the three of cups are women out drinking copiously, it looks like, or naked or something. And I just, there is such a Anne of Green Gables. I'm an Anne of Green Gables fan. I played Anne of Green Gables and um, I played Anne in Anne of Green Gables in my high school play. Um, and so this makes me think of, of that type of friendship discontentment. This is a deck, I should have said before, this is a deck based on the Rider Waite Smith. Um, and so you will see certain cards that I don't interpret the Rider Waite Smith way. But again, because I'm going to be using this as an oracle, um, that doesn't bother me. Um, but this is uh, definitely a Rider Waite Smith interpretation of the Four of Cups with discontent. Disappointment with the Five of Cups. And of course, you'll have the heartbreak with the Three of Swords. Um, because of Rider Waite Smith. I really like this. This makes me smile. It does make me think of childhood. I love the kind of distorted frogginess of um, the under, you know, portraying what it looks like underwater um, like that. I think it's a great um, painting. Fantasy. I also really love this. A for the Seven of Cups, but also I just like the painting. Moving on with the Eight of Cups. This is an interesting one because she's moving on, but she's coming into the house. She's going to go into the house and like pack up. Like it leaves so much to the mind. Serendipity. For I love the word serendipity. 
um, for the Nine of Cups and then fulfillment with the Ten of Cups. So then we get to the first of the court cards. So we have for the pages the um, sensitive child. Um, and I'm going to kind of hold these out so we can talk about the pages and the knights um, when we're done here. We have connection with the knight of cups, much more of a connection, not by soul, but by body here. Uh, we have, and then we have the queen and the king of cups. Um, and so they are just figure people there's no and there's no keywords that are there we have clarity for the ace of swords which i think is fantastic blind for the two of swords i love the swan there i love the edge of the water if we're just going from the heart or just going from the mind we're going from a place of blindness and we need to bring those two things together um, to really be able to see a situation i do really like that heartbreak for the three of swords again it's um right away smith um and again because i'm going to look at it I, you, you need a heartbreak card in, in a in a in a um, deck for relationships so i think that that's going to work fine uh, retreat for the four of swords i love the shadowiness of this but then the light that we're seeing outside i think it's really gorgeous defeat with the five of swords Moving forward with the Six of Swords. Betrayal with the Seven of Swords. You know, you usually see somebody sneaking in, um, somebody being sneaking up to no good. Um, so we have, you know, that with the Seven of Swords in uh, Right Away Smith. Here we have obscurity for the Eight of Swords, really not being able to see clearly. Um, and I, I love Eight of Swords that have mirror images in them because I think it's really poignant for the card. The, the well-known scream for anxiety in the Nine of Swords, destruction for the Ten of Swords, which is, again, you know, right away Smith. And then we have the, so we had the sensitive child, but now we have the traumatized child in the Page of Swords. Definitely doing the sort of... Um, uh, playing cards, spades uh, on, the, on the swords, and of course uh, this carries through in the Rider Waite Smith. Um, we have disconnect, so we had connection um, and the cups and disconnection and the Knight of Swords. So it's nice because we do have those two different energies that are in place. And then we have, I actually really love this picture of the Queen of Swords and the King of Swords. His men are all relatively creepy looking, I think. <laughs> That's all relative, right? Uh, passion for the Ace of Wands. Discussion for the Two of Wands, which I like. You know, you're making plans in the Two of Wands for yourself. But if you're with a, if you're a partnership, then that's a, a discussion. We have Jealousy with the Three of Wands. I like the green faces that are here. Celebration. This is the painting that the uh, tarot cloth is built on, and I do really love this painting. I think it just depicts light and shadow, the light fading or rising. I just really like this painting. Here we have conflict with the Five of Wands. Reconciliation, then, with the Six of Wands. Evasion with the Seven of Wands. And then communication with the Eight of Wands. We have stuck with the Nine of Wands. And overwhelmed with the Ten of Wands. That sense of heaviness that often comes with the Ten of Wands uh, in the Rider Waite Smith. So now we have the Adventurous Child in the Page of Wands. And Pursuit in the Knight of Wands. And then, of course, we have the king and the queen of wands. We have substance in the ace of uh, pentacles and exchange in the two of pentacles. Complete with the three of pentacles. Control with the four of pentacles, which makes sense. You know, it's always seen as the greedy card in, in Rider Waite Smith. Loss in the five of pentacles. 
this connection could have also gone there, right? Apology then in the Six of Pentacles, right? So a lot of these we are, especially between the Five and the Sixes, I feel like she just really shows where there's the problem and the Six comes in and reharmonizes it. This is an interesting one, and this is one where I feel like the format kind of um, is too bad, even though now that I know it, I'll always know it. Um, this, at first when I saw this, I'm like, okay, that's really strange. But when you read the, the piece about the Seven of Pentacles, and when you see the whole... Um, the whole painting, um, the his blood, his heartbreak, his wound of this, of this, um, of this um, relationship ending, um, is actually growing a flower. It's feeding a flower. It's growing something new that may, you know, he, if he has patience, that longing will ease. Um, you know, there will be peace restored um, in a way that I feel like because, you know, if she'd done it this way, she could not have gotten it, right? There was just no way for her to cut this in a way that we could really see that. But now that I know that's there, I know that that's growing this lily. But I do wish there had been a way you know, to honor the art, but maybe, you know, just copy and paste this down so that we could see it. But she's, you know, again, I'm not a curator. And so she's, you know, honoring, obviously, the art itself. But, you know, that's one of those ways. It's really the only one, I think, that it really would have been helpful to have been able to see a part that is missing. Um, here we have work with the Eight of Pentacles. Independence with the Nine of Pentacles. Again, very Anne of Green Gables feeling. Attainment with the Ten of Pentacles. And then we have a needy child with the Page of Pentacles. Um, an arrival. Remember, the one was a pursuit going outward, and then the one is an arrival coming inward. So I do really like what she did with the, um, the Knights. Uh, yeah, Pursuit. I, do, I like what she did with the knights and even the um, pages. And then I really love this card because this looks like my great-grandmother um, uh, and the queen. I have uh, several pictures of her, obviously, because she's my great-grandmother. And it just this reminds me of my great-grandmother. Um, and then the king of pentacles being um, a self-portrait of Monk himself. Not in hell in this case. Okay, so let's zoom out here a little bit, see my piles. Um, so obviously, as I said, the um, people, the king and queens are just people. And obviously, given that this is using the single artwork, a uh, Norwegian artist, um, it is, you know, you're all seeing various ages. I feel like the men are mostly older. And he's just kind of interesting looking. Um, various ages, but obviously these are all um, Caucasian uh, people of different different ages. Um, but you're not certainly going to get any racial diversity there. Um, I do like the... Um, adventurous child versus the needy child who is quite clingy you can just see somebody that's more a little bit more clingy um the traumatized and the sensitive child um uh, with the the um pages and then i like the arrival or pursuit the connection or the disconnection of the knights i think that that's really um uh, interesting way to work with those and then I really love the aces here where we have the passion and we have two uh, portraits and two horizontal uh, passion of the and clarity of for the ace of passion for wands clarity for swords hope for cups and substance for pentacles I really like those um, keywords for the aces um, I think those work really well so there is what we have. Again, um, I have done uh, a couple readings after the, the last walkthrough, um, and I haven't found the portrait horizontal. I've kind of enjoyed it, and it's, I do have another deck, the Rackham Oracle, that has both, and I know that people didn't really like that, but I also didn't mind it in that deck, so... Um, I would think that would be something that would bother my Libra brain, but for the most part, um, it doesn't. It's just kind of interesting. It, it 
provides a little bit of problems in just, you know, sort of laying things out. If you get, you know, of course now I'm going to all, you know, if you get different sizes. But I kind of liked the way that it ended up looking when I was doing readings. So yeah, I um, am excited to give this a try. I will try to um, come back after a while and let you know how... Um, it ends up working out for me uh, versus the first impression, although at least at least this was twice through the deck and um, and I did do a couple readings uh, with it as well. And so uh, I'm looking forward to diving into this a little bit deeper. And I do feel like um, it kind of already fulfills that promise of feeling like, it could be quite intensive in diving into uh, inner work or um, interpersonal, interpersonal work um, in a way that doesn't feel overly romanticized. It kind of um, has some of that, but then also has some of that feel of digging um, a little bit deeper below that sort of fluffy surface. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing how that um, goes out. So I hope this has been helpful. I will put a link, I believe it is in Kickstarter right now. Um, so I will put a link to that in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching.